Get ready for another informative presentation on the human microbiome. This one is entitled Healthy Aging and the Microbiome. I welcome you with a photo during my hike of the holy mountain Mandango, which overlooks Vilcabamba Valley in Ecuador, a region of exceptional longevity. Since many people are interested in living a life as healthy and as long as possible, and since the microbiome plays such an enormous role in our health, and since I am the microbiome expert, I thought I'd put together this webinar for you. I have some interesting data to present, and by the time we're done, you'll have a handful of takeaways for your own personal health. Now, although this is a presentation on the microbiome, we should also touch on other factors of longevity. But first, we'll take a brief detour with some background information. There are pockets of longevity to this day to be found all over the world. Some have better record keeping than others, some have a bit more myth than desirable, but they all have some things in common. The original pocket slash researcher combination for the record books would be Ilya Mechnikov in Bulgaria, where the modern probiotic addiction began. Although modern scientists attribute their longevity to other common factors we'll see. Okinawa, Japan, Sardinia, Italy, Nicoya, Costa Rica, Icaria, Greece, and Loma Linda, California were made famous in a book entitled The Blue Zones. There are also pockets in Manipur, India, in the Caucasus Mountains, in the Himalayas of Pakistan, and here where I live in Ecuador. In Ecuador, Vilcabamba Valley, in Spanish is also called the Valley of Longevity, or in Quechua, it's also called the Sacred Valley. The locals talk about their genes, fresh air, but mostly the water. Rain collected from the Amazon basin falls on the intercontinental divide, some of which descends a large national park and enters the valley. Here is a photo of Hidden Falls, which feeds the town of Vilcabamba. On one of my hikes, I ran across a man who looked as old as the mountains themselves. We talked for a bit, although he was difficult to understand as he had no teeth from what I could tell. When I asked him his age, he asked me what year it was. After I was done laughing, we figured out that he was 99 years old. And although he wouldn't let me take his photo, he's something like this woman here, keeping his body active as he's hiking down a mountain trail at reasonable elevation at the age of 99. Not only is physical activity important, but a laid back lifestyle seems to be as well. Exemplified by a saying here in Ecuador, which is a blend of Spanish and Quechua, chuja vida, which can be translated into enjoy your life, you only have one to live or YOLO. When considering all these locations around the globe, physical activity is consistently a part of their equation, and it usually involves walking in the mountains. These people are not Olympians, bodybuilders, or triathletes. They have fresh air, fresh water, fresh food, close communities, and a relaxed lifestyle. If we talk more of science, they have a set of signals in the body which also leads to longevity. You have to understand that much of what goes on biochemically in your body is a function of signals. For this conversation, we're going to highlight the main signals of longevity, which are tightly correlated to what we call feast or famine. When in feast mode, there are plenty of signals coming into the body, calories, amino acids, etc., which tells the body it's time to grow, become robust, and reproduce. It's a simple matter of evolution going all the way back to the origins of life. The opposite set is famine, which is a set of signals which tells the body to survive the day, so we can make it to the next feast so we can become robust and reproduce. Because in the end, it's all about reproduction. Nothing survives if it doesn't reproduce. So if you want to live a long, healthy life, overeating, overly intensive training, or no exercise at all, too much stress and other considerations should be addressed. However, you also have a whole other genetic ecosystem living inside of you, which needs to be cared for, and as you will see, is correlated with longevity and health. We'll start with a couple of studies in mice. I almost never reference animal data, but this is something we can't exactly replicate in humans. And although in mice, the results are impressive. To the left, the researchers exchanged the microbiome of young and old mice. The transfer of the microbiome from the old into the young accelerated a whole host of inflammatory and aging factors. And when transferred in the opposite direction, these factors are reversed. In figures A and B, you can see two measures of gut permeability, which is a topic I bring up on occasion in my webinars. These illustrate the significant alterations in gut permeability, a key factor in your health, 
when the microbiomes of old and young mice were transferred. In the second paper to the right, these researchers transferred the microbiome from young to old mice. Not only were there improvements in physical fitness, but also significant improvements in the skin as shown here in figures G, H, and I, which I'm sure is something that appeals to everyone. For this webinar, I did what I always do, which is to search all relevant published human fecal microbiome data from original research articles to build a complete picture of what the microbial fingerprint is for healthy aging. But aging is a bit different from the other health conditions I've analyzed. You'd think you could just go and look at microbiomes of centenarians, like they did in this paper, a paper I did not include in my meta-analysis. Although it sounds like a cool idea, what's your comparator? Just because someone lives to 100 years old does not mean that their microbiome is optimal. In fact, it's well known the microbiome worsens with age. In addition, there aren't that many centenarian studies published, for reasons you can imagine. So I looked at two sets of data points. The first set is centenarians as compared to much younger, healthy adults. But we also have to keep in mind that these people are living in harmony with their microbiomes for a reason. So there must be some component which is beneficial which is why it's helpful to have an expert interpret the data for you. The second set of data points I analyzed, which we'll see in a few slides, look at frailty in the elderly as compared to non-frail, age-matched elderly. This gives us a bit more of an apples-to-apples -apples comparison. Although they may not be centenarians, it gives us a feel for an unhealthy aging microbiome. Here's one of the nine centenarian studies I used. As you can see, with aging, there are significant reductions in the incredible health-promoting genera I mentioned all the time, such as Roseburia and Fecalibacterium, highlighted by the green arrows. We can also see a significant increase with age in the genus Agrothella, with the orange arrow, which is a genus known to house opportunistic pathogens. So this is the part of the normal unhealthy aging in the centenarian microbiome. And the yellow arrow points to the genus Acromantia, which is assumed to be a unique and healthy component of the centenarian's microbiome. And now we'll just look at one more of these nine papers. Highlighted graphically in a different way, we see those taxes shown to increase or decrease with age, including in people living up to 118 years old. Some of these taxa are the same in previous studies, like Roseburia, and others are new, such as Prevotella. The point being is that you have to read all of the relevant published literature to get an accurate picture of what the microbial fingerprint looks like for any given condition as results can vary quite a bit from study to study. When we put the data points together from all nine relevant centenarian studies, we get this chart. The x-axis lists the taxa which stand out in this microbial fingerprint, the keystone taxa, so to speak. The y-axis represents the number of studies where a significant difference was found for a given taxon. Orange represents the taxa that were significantly higher in centenarians as compared to young healthy controls. And green represents the opposite. Let's highlight a few of the taxa from this fingerprint. Fecalibacterium prausitzii, the superhero of the gut, is very consistently higher in young healthy controls versus centenarians. This is simply a function of the aging microbiome. Therefore, one of the principal goals should be to increase Fecalibacterium. Agrothella, as we touched on earlier, is a genus with opportunistic pathogens, the main culprit being Agrothella lenta. This too is a natural function of the aging microbiome, and we can reduce its number by increasing the health-promoting bacteria, such as Fecalibacterium. Acromantia, which in three studies was shown to be significantly higher in the centenarians, is likely contributing to their health. Acromantia is a great health promoter in a variety of conditions, but possibly not a good idea in others, as you'll learn in my presentations. The genera Allostypes and Odoribacter are generally universally healthy. So the fact that they are significantly higher in centenarians suggests to me that they are a part of the unique, healthy microbial fingerprint. Lastly, the genus Desulfo Vibrio is very interesting, as it infrequently has many data points in other conditions, but for some reason was found to be consistently, significantly, higher in centenarians versus the healthy young. 
It could be a unique component identifying this fingerprint or simply a component of aging. To expand upon the points I just mentioned, first, we will review the data points for the genus Fecalibacterium, which is essentially a one species genus, Fecalibacterium prausitzii, the superhero of the gut. Why is it a superhero? Because as you can see here, for almost every data point from all conditions I've analyzed over the years, Fecalibacterium prausitzii is consistently, significantly higher in healthy controls, shown in green, a good thing, as compared to the subjects from any given disease, state, or condition. This species is significantly reduced in aging, as we just saw, and your primary goal should be to increase its presence, which you can do with the intelligent use of prebiotics. We also noted how the genus Agrothella was consistently higher in the centenarians. And as we can see here, when we look at all the data points across multiple disease states and conditions, Agrothella is consistently shown to be significantly higher in the disease subjects, shown in orange, a bad thing, versus the healthy controls in green. So, high agrothella levels are not a part of the magical formula for centenarians. These opportunistic pathogens are increased in the aged microbiome, and your goal should be to reduce their presence. We also mentioned disulfo vibrio as being a possible part of the signature of the centenarian. Although it doesn't have nearly the data points as Fecalibacterium, across all conditions, there are modest data spikes for colorectal cancer, autoimmune conditions, and autism. In fairness, there are many more published papers on colorectal cancer and autoimmune conditions than in centenarians. Although the data appears mixed overall, there appears to be a disease-promoting trend when focusing on the spikes. Similarly to Fecalibacterium, the vast majority of the data points for Odoribacter across all conditions favor a health-promoting profile. Consistently, you can see how this genus is significantly higher in healthy controls, shown in green, as compared to the subjects with a given condition, in orange. You might think to yourself that there were only four studies in my previous chart for Odoribacter in centenarians, whereas there are 11 shown here for IBS. That's true, but in my IBS analysis, I used 54 relevant studies to compile the data. That means for IBS, the genus Odoribacter was shown to be significantly higher in healthy controls in 20% of the studies. But in centenarians, I only used nine studies in total. Therefore, Odoribacter was shown to be significantly higher in centenarians in 44% of the studies, an impressive number. And you could make the argument that it's actually 55%, but I won't get into that. This genus is the only one, to my knowledge, from the phylum Bacteroidetes, which has three different butyrate-producing enzymes. It is a clear health promoter and the most interesting part of the centenarian secret microbial fingerprint. Now let's look at some frailty data, which includes data for sarcopenia. Sarcopenia is a progressive loss of muscle mass, usually associated with aging. This study had some classic results. The non-sarcopenia controls were shown to have significantly higher levels of a number of clear health promoters, such as Eubacterium rectale, Fusicatenibacter, Roseburia, Lachnospira, and Eubacterium. The wide blue arrow pointing to the heat map highlights four butyrate-producing taxa, which were shown to be significantly correlated in a healthy way, with three sarcopenic characteristics. In figure A to the right, among the many pathways found to be altered in the microbial metagenome, the blue arrow highlights the significant increase in LPS DNA in the sarcopenic. I frequently discuss LPS lipopolysaccharide which is an indicator of dysbiosis. So this paper tells us that classic health-promoting butyrate producers are low and possible opportunistic pathogens are high in the frail. This is a story which is told over and over again across all disease states. If we look at just one more study out of the 13 I referenced to compare the frail versus the non-frail microbiome, we see more significant reductions in health-promoting butyrate producers on this slide. Two species from Eubacterium, two species from Roseburia, and Romanococcus obium, which was reassigned to the genus Blausia, are all butyrate producers and are all shown to be significantly reduced in frailty. This simply reconfirms the connection between various components of the microbiome to your health. When I compile the data points from all 13 of the frailty studies, we get this chart here. 
By now, you should be familiar with the axes and the colors. We see some overlap from the centenarian data, like the taxa Fecalibacterium, Roseburia, and Agrothella. But we also see some new keystone taxa, such as Prevotella, Eubacterium, and Eubacterium rectale. Eubacterium rectale is listed separately because it is no longer a species within the genus Eubacterium, as years ago it was reclassified into the family Lagnospiraceae but has retained its original name. When we compile the data from the nine centenarian studies and the 13 frailty studies, we get a more complete idea of the aging microbiome. As you're beginning to learn, the goal here should be to increase the taxa Blausha, Eubacterium, Eubacterium rectale, Fecalibacterium, Prevotella, and Roseburia. This in turn will minimize the opportunistic pathogens such as Agrothella. Other taxa such as Acromancia, Allostypes, Aneurotruncus, Buterosimonis, and Odoribacter are likely a part of the centenarian secret. Some taxa are easier to increase than others, and not all may be present inside your microbiome. The remaining taxa, Colincella, Desulfovibrio, and Parabacteroides, have uneven data points across many conditions, and their role here is yet to be elucidated. This is a slide you'll be seeing oftentimes in my presentations. This is the accumulation of thousands of hours of work determining the key players in the microbiome. Collected here are the great universal or almost universal health promoting taxa of the gut. The darker the green, the stronger the data as a health promoter. Out of a thousand or more species in your gut, this handful plays an enormous role in your health. These health promoting bacteria have been found to be consistently, significantly, higher in healthy cohorts and significantly lower in unhealthy ones across all diseases. Blue arrows mark the taxa from this order shown to be beneficial in aging. There are a few health promoting genera not listed here, such as Bifidobacterium, Allostypes, and Odoribacter, which are classified in other phyla. But these listed here are the main determinants of health in the gut. These incredible bacteria can occupy a lot of real estate and perform many health-promoting functions. In order to increase their number, you have to feed them the fuel they love. By doing so, you dramatically improve your microbiome and by extension, your overall health. Over the years, the many conditions I've analyzed do not have the exact same fingerprint, but they do have the same theme. This is true with aging. So which prebiotics are best suited for the aging microbiome? First, we have to consider which keystone taxa we want to focus on for healthy aging. The meta-analysis informs us that the classic health promoters such as Roseburia, F. prausitzii, Eubacterium, Odoribacter, and Allostypes should be optimized along with the species Acromancia mucinophila and the genera Blausha and Prevotella. Then we have to match these up to my meta-analysis of prebiotics highlighting which taxa prefer which substrates. Of course, the dose has to be sufficient to drive environmental change. If you found this presentation informative and you think addressing the health of your microbiome might be a good idea, then in the protocols tab of my website, themicrobiomeexpert.com, you can find a science-based protocol for this condition, among many other conditions. You're also invited to view and read my testimonials in its respective tab.